Okay, so um, I'm Paul Fellows. As I said in my little introduction earlier, I was recruited straight out of college to uh, join Acornsoft. Um, but in fact, I started uh, writing software for the BBC Micro uh, while I was still at college um, here in Cambridge when I should have been studying my, for my degree, really, but uh, didn't seem to do too much damage. So I think we got away with it. I was encouraged to do so because um, a friend of mine, Steve Barlow, who was at college with me, was building an acorn atom in his uh, uh, student room. And uh, I was fascinated by that. And so it led me to sort of discover acorn and uh, I managed to get hold of a BBC Micro from one of the fairly early uh, supplies of the machines. Uh, sadly, I've no longer got it. I don't know where it went. Uh, disappeared many, many years ago. Uh, we are, of course, going back something like uh, 38 years, uh, even 40 years now to go back to the atom. Um, so I'll start off and just sort of talk you through some of the things that I did um, in my very first attempts at writing software that was going to be published. And uh, the first three titles that I wrote while I was having a summer vacation and should have been revising were these three appeared published by Acornsoft. And uh, can you tell that my first degree was in chemistry by any chance? The, uh, these three, the first one on the left, chemical analysis, you uh, had to try and figure out what substance the uh, computer had in mind. It would pick one of a, a number of substances and then you had to choose a number of tests that you could run on it and you only had so many that you were allowed to choose. You had to try and home in on what the right answer was. It's a bit like uh, playing 20 questions against the computer and it wasn't quite that many, it was more like 10. And then the middle one, simulations, was really uh, similar in some ways. It took organic molecules and showed you the uh, infrared and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectra of them and got you to try and guess what was going on. So same idea. And then the chemical structures program, really, you, you entered uh, a fairly simple chemical formula and it would figure out what the shape of the molecule was and show it to you in 3D, much as is shown on the cover there. So very simple indeed. But uh, they, they went out and um, uh, were quite popular in schools at the time, uh, there being not much else that was around. So then I discovered the uh, computer system at uh, the uh, new museum site in Cambridge and uh, got my first account there and started wasting my time playing Colossal Cave until all hours of the morning. It was actually secretly secreted away on the uh, Mullard Radio Astronomy Observatory server, but if you knew the magic runes, you could uh, get on there and uh, run it. And what fascinated me about it was the idea that a computer could understand vaguely English text and react appropriately, a bit like Turing's imitation game, I suppose. And uh, I just had to write one. This is a bit of a common theme with me. When I see things, I have to figure out how they work. And the best way of doing that is write one of your own. So I started trying to do that and it turned into um, an adventure game. And uh, again, Acorn Soft were quite keen on having anything that uh, uh, had the bugs knocked out of it and publish these things on cassette to begin with and uh, then on disc. So uh, this one I sold to them. I think I got 300 quid for uh, the B version. I got 900 quid for the Electron version. Um, so uh, that was quite good, really. I mean, that was uh, nearly a whole year's. Uh, grant in those days that you used to get to try and live on so uh, not too bad and for many years afterwards I mean I'm, I'm, when I say many I'm talking 25 years I think it went on with people emailing me writing to me contacting me wherever I happened to be to ask how to solve some of the uh, uh, puzzles that were set within Sphinx Adventure and what I particularly enjoyed was one person who 
uh, managed to find their way through it all and produced a map. And we actually used that map with their permission to uh, put in a sealed envelope and send it out to people uh, who uh, bought the game so that they did. This was the uh, drawing that was sent in. I particularly like the Sphinx up at the far corner there. A uh, very nice little diagram of the, the madness that uh, it all uh, laid out. I never had a map to, of the whole thing. I had it in sections and you can really see where those sections are by looking at how this person has drawn the map. So I had it on some scrappy notes. Um, anyway, it was interesting and it was the whole point about it was trying to make the thing behave intelligently and react back to what you said. Um, and that was the, the topic that had fascinated me. I then got actually commissioned by uh, uh, David Johnson Davis, who was in charge of Acornsoft, uh, over the next summer holiday to write Acornsoft database. It came from the fact that I'd been working on the IBM mainframe and writing some sophisticated pattern matches that very, very rapidly could uh, do comparisons between uh, input strings and a pattern and say yes or no. And so you could use it to match sort of Fred Star Smith hash 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 against Fred or Frederick or any other combination there um, and some digits where the hashes were. And there were lots of other magic characters that allowed you to say how many of something you wanted and how many times it would execute. And you could have brackets and complicated expressions. So it was a bit heading towards uh, the uh, Perl programming in some ways. Um, and so tacking that together with a simple card index, we created uh, Acornsoft database and that went out. Uh, it went out on tape and on disc, but I had enormous trouble with the tape version until I discovered that it was the operating system's fault because I was using OS 0 0.1, the first version of the uh, Beeb operating system, and it had a horrific uh, tape filing system bug. And uh, it's all Hugo Tyson's fault, as I understand. I still see Hugo from time to time, on about once a week usually. And um, this was if you opened a file for random access onto the tape, then there was a 100% chance that it would corrupt the header of the, of the file. Uh, so not very useful. That got fixed in OS 1.2, of course. Um, turned out actually to be quite annoying for doing with some of the earlier developments because if you were just saving a file, so not opening it for random access but for write only, there was a one in 16 chance of it uh, rearing its ugly head and overwriting, corrupting the, the header file. And so uh, whenever I was saving copies of Sphinx Adventure, you know, my uh, lady friend who became my wife would come along and say, right, we're going out now. And you, just a minute, I've just got to save this. And it used to take 25 minutes to save Sphinx Adventure onto, uh, onto tape um, because I had to do it twice just to make sure that I didn't lose everything because of this horrific bug. Anyway, so that was Acornsoft database. Worked much better with disk, of course. It made almost no sense using tape. Much quicker to just write things down. Um, then along came this uh, abomination, Shirley Conran's Magic Garden. There it is. I was afraid the pack looks a bit tatty because it's got this sort of shrink wrap on it there. But um, this was a ghastly PR exercise that Chris Curry came up with. Um, and uh, he was hanging around with the, uh, the smart set down in London, including the Conrans, Terence Conran, the architect and designer and uh, his wife Shirley and she had written a book called Magic Garden in which she purported to tell you how to plant your garden and uh, have it grow effectively and so the idea was they would take the Acornsoft database with a fixed database of herbs and plants and a, a number of predefined queries that you could concoct to ask it what would grow best in your particular situation if you had acid soil or a, a particularly sunny wall that you wanted something to grow up then it would uh, come up with these suggestions 
I absolutely hated doing it. It was an appalling job, particularly because of some of the people it had to deal with in, in terms of uh, writing it. But it was compensated for, as it says on the screen, by the most magnificent launch party down at the headquarters of uh, the champagne vendors Mo and Shondo in London. And um, I was the long haired idiot sat in the corner with a BBC micro while the great and the good were all milling around talking. And every now and again, someone would come up for a, for a demo story of my life to some extent in those days. But again, this was all written while I was still at college. Um, and then for my, uh, I finished my chemistry degree and uh, quite successfully, and then decided I would do the uh, diploma in computer science course that uh, Cambridge offered in those days. Uh, they don't anymore, it's all changed. It's now an MPhil course. Um, but you still had to write a 10,000 word thesis at the end of the course, and I did. Uh, and I used as the subject of my thesis writing a compiler for the BBC Micro, and I chose Pascal as the target language for this, um, keeping it to a fairly simple profile with no, none of the complicated record structures, no floating point, and just doing 16 bit uh, integers for the maths. And it compiled down to a pure 6502 machine code. Um, so RAN really, once you'd compiled something, it uh, was the fastest language on the BBC Micro, because uh, all of the other Beeb languages were either pure interpreters, like BASIC and Lisp and Forth, or they compiled down to an intermediate code, which was then interpreted. And in particular, that's how the uh, BCPL compiler that uh, Jobson and Richards produced for us, which we'll mention in a moment, worked. And so re really this was uh, definitely the, uh, the quickest way of doing things. The compiler was written in BASIC and could compile a program in RAM to produce object code in RAM or could spool things out to disk and indeed could bring the source code in from disk in the later versions. Um, now I can't quite remember if those later versions ever got published or not. My, my memory fades there. Uh, but of course, being a, a t typical software engineer, I pinched bits of code from wherever I needed them. And some of the parser for this was lifted out of the back end of Sphinx Adventure. So uh, you can't keep a good program down. Bits of Sphinx Adventure kept turning up in other Acornsoft programs for quite some time, actually. I kept nicking bits of code from it. And it used the machine, uh, to generate the machine code, it used the inline assembler in BASIC. So it would just uh, parse its way through and say, right, that means open square brackets, load A, blah, 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 close square brackets. And that would pop the machine code into the, uh, the right place, um, into the file. And uh, so it would go on. Now, a slight side project, um, my dad, started writing some code to try to play bridge. He was a very good bridge player and a uh, physics teacher. So uh, he uh, pr put this uh, beginnings of this program together and then I took it and wrapped a load of graphics around it, which you can see at the bottom there. And uh, it uh, played really rather well, actually. It got reviewed by Omar Sharif in the uh, one of the national newspapers and uh, the, they were waxing lyrical about the way it had finessed the Queen. And when we looked into the, uh, the rules that Dad had uh, put together for uh, what circumstances to uh, play what card, we realised that it had gone through all its rules, given up, and decided to, to do the default that I'd put in there, which was play any random card. Um, and indeed, that was the card that had been uh, so... Uh, lauded as a fantastically intelligent thing to do but uh, so uh, you now know that something that only two of us knew at the time which was it was pure luck so if I wrote that with my father I wrote this one with my wife uh, she was heavily into cocktails she wasn't an alcoholic but she did like a, a few cocktails and uh, we got the job of putting another miniature database together to go with another book called The Complete Cocktail Maker. The book's shown at the bottom there, written by Geoffrey Hindley. 
Um, and it was suggested that rather like Magic Garden, we do a bastardized version of the Acornsoft database program to go with it. So I ignored those instructions because I realized that uh, there was a much better way of doing it, which was to carefully define a very compact representation of what the possibilities were for all of the ingredients um, and the glass and the color and the accoutrements to go with a particular cocktail and how much of each. And we managed to cram a terrific amount of uh, different cocktail definitions into a RAM based system so that you could just load the whole program up from tape or disc and it uh, it would go from there it's also very very quick to search and you could ask it you know cocktail of the day or give me an orange cocktail or give me something that's uh, using vermouth and it would come up with a, a recipe and a picture of the correct shape glass to put it in um, in the right color all done with rather lurid mode 7 graphics but again, we had an absolutely fantastic launch party for this at a cocktail bar in London and uh, got very, very drunk. I also put a game together. I worked with uh, some of the other guys from Acorn Soft and this one I pinched uh, some of the game it, writing code from Jonathan Griffiths who wrote Snapper and various other things, Rocket Rain, I think, um, and put this together. Just uh, playing around in my own time. And it was when the BBC Master was coming out, so 1984, I think that would be. And uh, suddenly I realised that nobody had thought about redoing the welcome tape um, for the BBC Master. Uh, they just assumed they were just going to ship the same old thing, which given that it had, you know, rather nicer features in some ways, I, th I said, hang on a minute, we, we need to do a new version here. And um, then they went scratching around for games and they, they put this thing that I'd written here um, on there. So in case anybody's ever come across that, that's where that came from. It was a sort of backroom project that I was just playing around with. But my day job, when I'd finished writing S. Pascal and graduated from the uh, diploma course, was I was hired and put immediately in charge of the Cornsoft Languages Group which was myself, Tony Thompson, who's, I uh, haven't seen him for ages, but last I knew he was at arm. Stu Swales, who I worked with many times um, beyond Acorn, and likewise Richard Manby, who I'm still in touch with. And our job was to get all of the languages that anyone had ever thought of, and a few beyond, and make them available for the uh, BBC Micro. And we did that by a combination of writing stuff ourselves and working with third party authors, some of whom are listed there. So Lisp, that was Arthur Norman, uh, Richard Harrison was fourth, Johnson and, uh, Jobson and Richards was the BCPL and the logo, Microprologue was McCabe, Comal was the Christensen brothers. And I've, I've forgotten to put ISO Pascal, which was Ben and Lionel from uh, Acorn at uh, Fullbourne Road but they were internal Acorn people, really. Plus, there are a bunch of other programs that we, uh, uh, or language systems that we were engaged in the process of producing that never really made the light of day. We had a Fortran compiler for the BBC Micro that Stuart and Tony had been working on for ages, but never quite made it. Uh, we did APL for the Z80 coprocessor, um, in conjunction with another group of external authors and we had thrust upon us to publish the UCSDP system which was another implementation of Pascal for the 6502 uh, second processor you needed for that so you had to have uh, the Beeb and the 6502 and UCSDP system software and then you got a Pascal implementation that was slower than either of the other two and uh, really wasn't worth uh, bothering with so um, that took you know quite a quite a lot of effort quite a few years putting all those uh, together and getting all the manuals written and testing them getting the bugs out with the authors but uh, the team then sort of grew and we also got involved in some utility programs I suppose you would call them and the three that are particularly relevant here uh, 
one was Turtle Graphics, which was kind of a precursor to um, the logo language. The basic editor, which one of my favorite uh, bits of software, with Chris Gibson and Pete, sorry, I've forgotten his surname. If anyone can remind me, that would be great. Um, produced this uh, editor for basic that uh, would edit the program in memory without detokenizing it uh, completely into text. And uh, it was very, very slick. I used that all the time once I got the hold of that. I thought it was a great thing and a real hot seller, actually. It sold a lot of copies. I think 30,000 copies of Basic Editor ROM were sold, which was a lot for uh, one of our languages uh, group products. It was one of the, the hot sellers. And then also th kind of thrust upon us from uh, the uh, marketing side was the VT52 and VT100 terminal emulator ROM. And uh, we were involved in testing and debugging that and working with the authors before it went out. Useful in that quite a lot of universities used Beebs as terminals. So I think it probably sold quite a lot of BBC micros for Acorn, even if uh, it didn't sell uh, in its own right for any reason. So uh, probably did quite a good job there. So anyway, moving into a slightly lower, sort of more technical side, which you guys will appreciate. I'm going to talk a little bit about memory maps and it's a favorite subject of mine to this day really or until fairly recently because uh, getting uh, some of the younger programmers that have worked for me to think about this on various projects is always hard but uh, the most important things to understand about the BBC Micro which it told you when it woke up was that it had 32k um, and there were a couple of things active that in the picture there, we've got Acorn DFS and basic and the basic prompt, of course. And critical to, to all of this was really how that uh, 32K was organized. And in fact, how the ROMs were organized with it, making up the whole 64K of address space. You probably understand this just as well as I do, but uh, we had zero page at the bottom, very special. Um, first 256 bytes due to the architecture of the 6502 and then the stack uh, for the 6502 in the next 256 bytes and then some operating works system workspace and a filing system workspace for things like sound and the cassette file system econet dfs and so on up to a place that i call page because that's what basic called it which by default on a uh, cassette machine would be at hex e100 but would move further up um, if you added more filing systems and that would eat into where you had memory for your basic program which went from there up to the uh, bottom of where screen memory started so we'd call that high mem and then you'd have uh, between 20k for the high resolution graphics modes down to 1K for the Teletext Mode 7. Above that, you got your four or more paged ROMs that sat at hex 8000 to BFFF. And then the operating system went all the way to the top with a little chunk taken out for hardware IO registers that some of you hardware bashers know more about than I do. So uh, that's the, the basic idea of the memory map. And I've put that in because it was critical in thinking about how to get around the limitations of this that led really onwards to quite a number of other things that came along afterwards. So we'll come back to that. But one thing that caught my eye, I think I read every page of the BBC Micro User Guide uh, inside out and backwards, was that it said in the in amongst the section on the VDU commands, it said these commands are reserved for the graphics extension ROM on some of the uh, calls that weren't actually filled in with a proper definition. And I thought, that's interesting. Must find out more about this supposed graphics extension ROM. So I started going off and talking to people about it and trying to find out if anyone knew anything about it. Um, but I'd also seen advertised in one of the Acorn user magazines, uh, a, 
a thing called extended color fill graphics which uh, had been published by a third party and allowed you to create uh, patterns that were alternating dots of um, the predefined colors so you could be in uh, mode one and you could have alternating pi pixels of um, green and red and it made it look yellow to this to the eye if you stood back a bit so you could get more colors apparently than the mode uh, that you were in and I thought how does this work eventually I, I found out how it worked and the two of those really coalesced because I went talking to as many people in Acorn as I could find and eventually discovered that there was a bunch of ideas for having extra graphic commands circles rectangles flood fill pattern fills which is what the ecfg thing did even new graphics modes that were being talked about um, so cutting the size of the screen down and giving you a, a fewer pixels uh, but a uh, therefore a lower memory footprint for the screen but as many colors as the hardware could produce as used by some games later but uh, that never made it to see the light of day and of course the vdu 19 command always enticed you with those three zeros on the end as to that that was going to give us a full color palette with uh, rgb um, now we actually implemented a bit of hardware at uh, Acornsoft that allowed us to do that full color palette we shouldn't have been making hardware we were a software business but never mind we we did that and it never really got released but what did happen was that the uh, guys at Fullborn Road at Acorn who were in charge of the operating system sort of finally uh, agreed that they would put some time into specifying what it was they had in mind um, provided we went and provided the resource to implement it you have to understand we were separate limited companies co-owned by the the, uh, the founders but the uh, the money was started to show its ugly head from time to time as to who was providing resources for different projects and so we worked with david seal frighteningly clever chap that he is over at uh, fullborn road to specify all of the vdu commands that we wanted for this graphics extension rom and richard manby did a lot of the work on implementation but we put together the gxr for os 1.2 now it was decided then that the, the master 128 was coming along and uh, or at least the master in general the master 64 or master 128 was the one that made it to see the light of day in the end for reasons that become apparent and um, they wanted to have some extra zing to that so they got us to build all of those gxr facilities into the master's main large rom and uh, sit there in around about 8k i think it was we had we were allocated for the graphics routines so we, we crammed in as much as we could into the master and held back the launch of the graphics extension ROM until after the master had gone on sale. Um, and uh, well, I think we had to produce two versions just to, to give you the full detail one for the Beeb and uh, with OS 1.2, and one for the B, because the operating system had changed uh, in a couple of important ways. And so our hooks into it had to change. But nevertheless, uh, GXR turned out to be a real hot seller because it enabled you to upgrade your earlier machine to have the uh, exact same graphics capabilities as the master 128 had but the other thing it did was put myself and richard and the acornsoft languages team rather more on the radar of uh, acorns management from a technical side as being competent and all-round good eggs that could manage to do something and deliver it on time um, uh, because prior to that I don't think they had very much time for uh, the the Acornsoft people who they they saw as just games programmers um, quote unquote 
So there's that memory map again drawn differently and you can see I've put here instead uh, the sort of graphics buffer and the, the ROMs in uh, fairly prominently there because that's going to be important because the next piece of the puzzle if you like that came along was the addition of extra RAM to try and make that language workspace that runs from page to high mem bigger by getting rid of the space occupied by the graphics buffer that goes from high mem to 7FFF. And that was invented by Chris Jordan with his Ares B20 and other people came along with similar products. They added an extra bank of RAM and it was paged in and out. So it was mapped into the memory map only when the 6502 instruction fetch was carried out on the uh, data bus and there was a pin coming out the side of the 6502 the, uh, that told you whether it was fetching an instruction so you could do that latch the address work out that it was code that was in the operating system ROM look at the address that it was trying to access see if it was in the range that the video RAM was overlay, supposed to overlay if it was you would direct the uh, extra RAM on the daughter board here to uh, re respond to the read or write request as a, a knock out the main RAM and leave it. And the result was that code that was in the language ROM would see the languages workspace all the way up to uh, the 32K boundary and code that was in the operating system would uh, see just the video RAM. Now I say operating system, it was tied to a very limited portion of the operating system that was the code that was dealing with graphics and writing to the screen. And there was a fairly tight and uh, small range of code so that it was able to do that and make the memory map look like this. So that if you accessed from that bit of the operating system, then you went for this shadow RAM, as it was called, that sat at the same addresses alongside where the graphics buffer would have been. Um, but now that was all language workspace. So suddenly you could now write a program that would run in uh, mode two uh, using 20K for the graphics buffer um, and still have the full, whatever it was, 24 to 28K of language workspace available. And that was taken up by Acorn. I presume they did a deal with Chris Jordan somewhere along the line. I don't know. But uh, the, the BBC Plus, B Plus was born, which had this feature built in. So allowed the machine to have more RAM and make use of it. So there's your B Plus, and uh, it looked exactly the same in the case. I'm sure you know and uh, just had this extra memory. It was the first thing that was done as an upgrade. And it was a small, modest step forward. And the fact that it was called B plus should tell you that there was uh, loose talk inside the company of a Model C at some point, and this was not it. Uh, it was a bit of a clue that there was something else coming. I don't think that was a terribly closely guarded secret. But we knew it was going to happen when we were doing the graphics extension ROM and we had to also make sure that the GXR didn't just access video RAM itself. It had to always call back into the operating system to, and use the OS plotline um, routine and its friends to do the work of writing to the uh, uh, actual graphics buffer or indeed reading from it for those calls where that was an important feature. And uh, if it was, hadn't done that, then it wouldn't have worked with, with this uh, Shadow RAM or with the Ares B20 board. But we knew that this was all happening, so we were able to make sure that it did. Now a little word about ROMs, because this uh, also is part of the, the story that uh, I want to tell you. You know how the sideways ROMs work. There's a latch that tells you which one of the four sockets on the board is paged in. 
and you probably also know that you can actually have up to 16 ROMs supported by the operating system even though the machine only had four in the um, hardware implementation it only looked at two bits on the latch and uh, the, the way that the operating system works is that things it's not doing itself uh, it passes round to the ROMs and they pass to each ROM actually it goes back to the operating system and is then passed on to the next one but it's as if they're daisy chained together the software passes through them in order to see if any of the ROMs want to implement the calls concerned. So things like star commands that are not known to the operating system can percolate round like that. Unknown OSBYTE calls, unknown OS words, those sorts of things get chained through. And uh, various other service calls as well. And it's always important when writing the ROMs to make sure that you, you don't interfere with that process and block a command that you're uh, not supposed to be blocking. There were one or two naughty ROMs that were written by other people who should remain nameless um, and uh, that uh, used to interfere with that process. They, they thought they would intercept one of the OSBYTE 163 uh, calls and intercepted all of them by mistake um, so that other things then stopped working, particularly my lovely ISO Pascal ROMs wouldn't work if Printmaster was in there. Oh, I've mentioned it. There you go. But of course, for ROMs, when you've got DFS in there and perhaps uh, the NFS for Econet and BASIC, you haven't got room to put ISO Pascal in there because it was two ROMs, one for the compiler and one for the runtime system. And so it wasn't very long before people started uh, taking advantage of the fact that the operating system had a four bit count for the ROMs and building a variety of sideways ROM boards that would uh, plug into your machine and let you have more ROMs. This was a wonderful thing because otherwise you'd be plugging the ROMs in and out and the sockets would fall apart. That was wonderful for us at Acornsoft Languages because we were one of the chief proponents of producing ROMs for things. I think we probably produce more things in ROM than anybody else. And so it's absolutely vital to be able to uh, stack them up like this. Um, but it wasn't long actually before we started running out of space even for that. And uh, so we thought, well, what can we do about this? And it was at the time that the Electron was coming along and the uh, Electron had those cartridges in the plus one where you could put uh, two 16K ROMs side by side in one cartridge and enabled us to do Pascal in the, the full version um, and uh, Logo, which was also 32K of code, including the runtime system because uh, it used the BCPL runtime system to get itself uh, going. Um, but the problem for the Beeb was really what, what can we do to get more uh, ROM space and uh, I had a mad idea and made this work we managed to put more than one 16k chunk in one logical ROM socket so we made a PCB with two 16k ROMs on it and a little latch and made it so that you could hit that latch and it would switch which of your two 16k banks were exposed. In fact, we made it work with four banks um, on the second version uh, using a little programmable logic array that sat on the, the board and allowed you to uh, talk to four different ROM images within one chip uh, as if it was all occupying only one slot. And the operating system was. Uh, unaware that you were using more things than one in a, in a particular slot. The way we did it, we, we had a read sensitive latch arrangement. So we stole four addresses off the end of the ROM and used them. So if you read BFFC, then it would put naught into our latch and you'd be in sub bank zero of this one particular ROM slot and so on. So you could write code like load immediate uh, sorry, load A, uh, BFFC, comma X, and switch to bank X within your mega ROM, as we called them. 
which is nothing to do with the, the large ROM that held the operating system and all its devices on the uh, master. That also gets called a mega ROM, but that came later. You lost four bytes of your ROM space in the process, but I always argued that people could take their names out if they complained that uh, they couldn't save four bytes of code because uh, the ROM that couldn't be squashed hadn't been written. Where there was always a little bit you could do to squeeze a few bytes out of it. And so what happened was that the uh, operating system would send the, all these calls around through the ROMs and they would pass through just as normal, but they would go into our mega ROM, which would contain four images and it would offer it back to itself um, uh, four times before passing it on if it uh, wasn't interested or using it if it was, implementing it if it was. And so all of this happened behind the operating system's back. So in theory, you could have plugged four of these uh, mega ROMs, one into each slot and had 16 images within the four slots of a machine. Or if you really wanted to go mad, you could stack them up and have uh, 16 in a uh, machine each with four in there and that was going to be enough but you did have to have these little butterfly boards with the uh, programmable logic array on there with the uh, code that we produced a bit burnt into it but it absolutely worked a treat and uh, just the icing on the cake was our man tim dobson games programmer at acorn soft extraordinaire wrote uh, monsters and maze and one or two other things figured out some code that you could add to the uh, header of your or the link to the header code of your ROM that could be exactly the same code in all four uh, ROM banks inside the mega ROM and would pass the operating system calls recursively round through all of them and fall out the other side um, and didn't even have a load a instruction to access the the latch what it did was it used the 6502's own instruction fetches so you put the code overlaid it on those four read sensitive instructions at the end and uh, just by virtue of the 6502 reading the the instruction from memory um, that was enough to trip the latch into the right state now unfortunately i tried to find and couldn't find the uh, the code and I'm not smart enough these days to go and reinvent it uh, uh, you'd have to ask Tim but it was incredibly clever and it even relied on the fact that the 6502 would be reading one instruction ahead of the one you were implementing in order to implement its pipeline and so that was actually the uh, prefetch of the pipeline that put you in the right bank at the end of all of this uh, convoluted code that he had and it, it wasn't long it was like eight instruction loop that did the, the the business so very very slick anyway the b plus one two eight comes along puts 64k of ram into the sideways rom banks by stuffing uh four of them with 16k each essentially uh, cut down the number of ROMs you could have, but we had a solution for that. Um, and the real headache was that although it had said 128K on the label, the um, amount of memory that you could still get for your typical program, be it basic or view or view sheet or any of those, was exactly the same as it had been on the B+, because none of the uh, language ROMs knew how to use that extra uh, memory that was sat there in the memory map in the same address space that they were very difficult indeed and so uh, we had the memory map looking like this now with the uh, shadow ram still giving us the language workspace maximized up to uh, the 32k boundary and the extra four lots of 16k squeezed into the uh, language rom position but I had a crazy idea for this one day. I thought, right, we can do something with this. We can flip the memory map kind of upside down as regards the language 
and put the interpreter for basic in the main memory in the language workspace and then spread the whole of the user program across the four 16k sideways RAM banks giving a full 64k of user space for the basic uh, program to reside in and uh, use. Now some people told me this was impossible uh, someone said suicide I think that was Sophie and uh, also that it was going to be appallingly slow and generally a bad idea um, but we thought well we hadn't got much else to do we'd by this stage write, written every language that anyone was interested in so we uh, checked out the uh, source code of BBC basic and had a go at it it was interesting to look at the source code of BBC Basic because it had comments in. It had precisely two comments in it at the time. One said greater than 32767, so don't. And the other one said greater than 32767, so can't. And that was it. You're on your own. Uh, but we worked through it and found where there were a limited number of places as it turned out that you had to make modifications and we made this work and it was not much slower typically 10 to 15 percent slower than running the uh, equivalent benchmark program in the ordinary manner so it worked really rather well and uh, the uh, marketing people were cock a hoop because they were able to demonstrate that uh, this machine had a full 64k free for basic programs even when you were in the highest resolution graphics modes um, which made it uh, definitely more appealing in some ways to people than um, the uh, uh, B plus with only 64k otherwise this machine would have looked exactly the same and so is the memory map with running BAS 64 or BAS 128 I can't remember which we called it in the end but uh, I think I called it BAS 64 in the first place and it got changed to BAS 128 because it ran on the 128k machines so the interpreter sat there uh, bet between uh, Oz High Watermark and um, the uh, or page as we call it uh, and uh, 7FFF and then flipped the uh, 16k RAM banks in and out as it needed to to pretend that you had a sort of virtual address space of 64k and absolutely everything that you could write in basic worked across that it, um, it dynamically ad uh, adjusted all the addresses when it was accessing them so quite a neat trick really Then we move on a little bit and there was this thing the 16032 which became renamed the 32016 uh, the national semiconductor chip this was part of the original plan and contract with the BBC themselves that we had to produce a 32-bit second processor add-on and so they perhaps put more effort into this because of that contractual obligation then was really sensible because it went on and on and on with National Semiconductor taking forever to make the chip work reliably and even towards the end the chip really didn't work very well indeed uh, you generally had to run the thing with the lid off um, because the chip got so hot that the glue underneath that label on it would boil um, and be bubbling away while you were running it. It really was uh, just a technology that didn't want to work. And we had the Panos operating system that was developed and that went on and on and really didn't do a huge amount when you got it because it sort of arrived uh, with virtually no tools or, or applications or anything that anybody wanted. So this was a bit of a dead duck. And um, the uh, National Semiconductor had produced a very lovely poster for the 16032, as it was originally named. And it said, the 16032 is not an, a late 16-bit processor. It is an early 32-bit processor. That was their marketing slogan. Well, the one we had on the wall had the, uh, the word early crossed out. So it said, 
the 16032 is not a, a late 16-bit processor, it's a late 32-bit processor, which told you what we thought of it. But around about the same time, other things were going on in Acorn. Um, and you probably remember the Communicator, a machine that really never sold very well at all. Um, and uh, I think the only thing that came out of it was that a modified version of the case was used for the Master Compact. But uh, this machine suffered what I call hijacking of purpose in the marketing sense. It was forced into a niche market of being a network terminal doing dial up. And so vehement were the aspirations of people that that's what it was dedicated to being. And it would only work with Prestel and uh, you know one or two industrial applications. But it, there was no floppy drive interface on it or anything. So you couldn't really use it for other purposes. And because the software that was written was different, it uh, made it very difficult to port anything over onto it. Um, and so basically it sort of flopped onto the market and they sold a few to their initial batch of customers and then it died. People lost interest. Except uh, I had my eye on it because I thought this machine's got potential to be quite a good stopgap and become that Model C that never was. And in fact, Paul Bond, one of the original authors of the Beeb operating system, myself, uh, aided and abetted by Stuart and Tony from the uh, languages group, spent all night one night writing a proposal to the management suggesting that we use a uh, communicator and that we would write a Beeb-like operating system for the processor, the 65816. Um, and produce a um, new machine that could run uh, with fairly modest effort quite a few of the programs. We would be able to have BBC Basic for it quite quickly. Uh, we talked to Mark Colton and had him signed up to port some of his applications like View and View Sheet over onto it. And it would have allowed us to have 256k of memory in a Model C BBC Micro uh, with a little bit of work. Um, I still think that would have worked. I quite like the 65816 with its 24-bit addressing and uh, therefore theoretically up to 16 megabytes of RAM. Be nice to have a BBC Micro that did that, wouldn't it? Even today. Of course, other arms within Acorn were doing this, the most hideous machine I've ever seen. And uh, these Cambridge workstations or Acorn business computers that were a BBC with a second processor in, strapped in the back of a 1950s model television set by the look of them. And they spent enormous amounts of money wasting all the profits from the Beeb on doing this and driving the, the uh, company near bankruptcy. Uh, only to be finished off by uh, the foul up with the Electron, where we made too many in one go and it was late. Not really the Electron's fault. We'd have survived it quite well if uh, we hadn't done all of these. But this again was that hijacking of purpose where there were quite a lot of uh, middle management that had been hired into Acorn who thought that they didn't want to make toy computers and they thought the BBC was a toy computer and were very dismissive of it. They wanted to make proper computers uh, for business applications with green screens and all sorts of other insanities. And uh, they were trying to make these systems into things that they just were not. The uh, Z80 second processor was never really going to compete with being an IBM PC clone. The amount of memory was wrong. The 286 uh, with uh, and the 186 processor that they used, wrong. And as for the Nat Semi 32016, well, it was just, uh, you know, just meltdown. It just never worked properly. But fortunately for the story, all this had been going on in the background. It had been going on since 1983, in fact, since I joined the company. 
and Arthur Norman of the Acorn Soft Lisp language and uh, Sophie and uh, Steve Ferber and others had been conspiring to produce the RISC machine. Uh, and the first chips finally arrived in early 1985, went into second processor boxes as development systems, and it pretty much worked straight away. There were one or two gremlins they had to get out of it. One of the things that happened on the very first power up of the first ARM chip that you may have heard of was that uh, they discovered they'd forgotten to connect the power supply to the chip. Um, and it was running using only the induced power off the data bus, uh, which was a sign of things to come. It's just how low power this uh, design was going to be with only 25,000 gates uh, for a whole processor, full 32-bit architecture was a tiny fraction of the number of uh, gates that even a, a 286 was using at the time. They had grown and had a, a group over in Palo Alto and they were developing the operating system to go with the arm. They called it ARX and it was a full blown attempt to have everything that you had in Unix operating systems preemptive multitasking, multi-threading, multi-user, full sort of mainframe style architecture. And they'd chosen to write it in Modular 2 or Acorn Extended Modular 2 Plus as to give it its correct title. And uh, Modular 2 is a funny language, it's derived from Pascal, but it has endless amounts of type checking in it to make sure that you're not being a naughty programmer and uh, doing things that you shouldn't, uh, which is all well and good in its place, but not something I would particularly choose to put into an operating system because it was slow. It was dog slow. And uh, it's a quote from uh, one of the, the team there saying, much of the operating system ran in user mode and suffered uh, due to switches into kernel mode to perform uh, mutexes for its uh, multitasking. Well, yeah, I don't think that was the only reason. I'll come back to that. The other problem was it was late. And in fact, it was so late given that the chips had arrived and the uh, design for the uh, first uh, Acorn Archimedes machines as they became were coming along that uh, something had to be done. The hardware was almost finished. And that something was Project Arthur. I say born out of desperation for the fact that we had hardware and no software. Um, Jim Merriman, the technical director, and uh, Sophie came to see me and said, what are you guys doing at Acorn Soft? Can you write us a BBC Micro-like operating system to run on this thing? as a stopgap measure. By the way, you've got five months. So being young and stupid, I said yes. So uh, Arthur was born. Um, it was the code name for the project to begin with, but we didn't have a name for the operating system, so it became that as well. And uh, to start with, there were the uh, guys named on the list here, myself, Tony, and Stuart and Richard from Acorn Soft Languages, Tim from Games and from Mega Rom Trick Programming fame, very, very hot programmer. Nick Reeves, also very hot, came from the same college as I did, and our Australian friend Brian, who uh, had done a lot of work on the Econet file system for the BBC Micro, so was the obvious choice for that. And the target hardware to begin with was the uh, six, uh, the second processor boxes with the ARM processor in them. But fairly soon after that, we got first one of these and then got one each eventually. And uh, this plugged into the tube, so ran as a second processor to the BBC Micro. It's the biggest second processor ever. And had on it, well, this particular one's got all four chips on. There was an earlier version that only had three of them. This has got the ARM processor, the VIDC, the MEMC, and the IOC, the four chip set. Um, and uh, we used these to begin 
doing the code for the operating system and gradually got one function after another up and running locally. So for a long time, you had a BBC Micro with its monitor, with one of these next to it plugged into the tube, and then you had a keyboard plugged into this, and then a monitor plugged into this, and you could write your code and load it in via the BBC Micro and test it, um, and see if you could get the various functions on the machine to work, um, and send your debug back down the tube onto the BBC Micro, so you had a a set a nice output system for doing all the logging and debugging a very helpful way of doing it uh, but eventually those machines called the a500 second processor cards were replaced with a500 standalone machines but of course to begin with these didn't uh, run standalone either we had a uh, module plugged into them with the tube interface just like we had on the uh, earlier prototype cards and they connected into a beeb and uh, used to run in the same way until with a fateful day when it, it came to the point of cutting the umbilical we had all of the uh, system transferred over and up and running so the mouse the keyboard the screen and uh, even the uh, floppy disk drive working and it was a case of shutting down the, the tube module and pulling it out and seeing if the machine still ran and it did and the machine in the photograph here was my machine um, and I know it's my machine because the keyboard's got the orange stickers that I put and wrote different things on to change the functionality of the keys over um, and some tip x on one of the other keys as well and this was the very very first machine that um, ran standalone So here's the circuit board of it, and uh, you can see the, f the four ROMs in which Arthur lived and all the RAM and the, the other chips that are all part of the equation there for the, uh, this A500 machine. Quite a lot of chips, quite a big circuit board actually. Four meg of RAM. And the uh, software, well, we had a core operating system that uh, did most of the things that the B machine operating system does. And then a structure of relocatable modules, RMs, that were made to look like sideways ROMs. In fact, they all have a header on the front of them, software header, that is derived straight out of the uh, sideways ROM header that you have on a BBC uh, sideways ROM. So it really was copying it. And I'm not kidding, we all had a copy of uh, Andy Bray and uh, Ian Holmes's uh, advanced user guide for the BBC Micro sat on our desks and used that as the Bible. If you wanted to know how to implement something and what the API should look like, it's in the book. Um, and so at those stages, Arthur was a command prompt, uh, would come up and say, Arthur version 0, 0.0 point something. 0.0.57 was a particularly good vintage, as I recall. We actually sold some of those to Olivetti. Um, and then we had all the way through to Arthur 1.0, which we tried to send off to the ROM factory. Uh, that came back, replaced by 1.1, because we found a hideous bug. And it, that same happened to that. And so Arthur 1.2 went out as the first version, which uh, was... Uh, almost seemed like a contrived coincidence given that the BBC operating system of choice was always version 1.2. Um, I think uh, that was more my choice than an accident. And as I say, all versions of RISCOS have still really got a beeb inside them somewhere. It's hidden, buried, but it's still in there. So on Arthur, we had the, the memory map controlled by the MEMC chip. And it, the ARM processor was limited to 26 bits of addressing in those days. So you had 64 megabytes of address space. And we had to halve that into physical memory and logical memory. So we cut it down to 32. And then divvy up the uh, pages in MEMC. And I might not have got this exactly right because I did it from memory. They were, they were certainly 32K in size. 
So I think we cut them into uh, 32 chunks to give a four megabyte footprint. <clears throat> and 32K was the smallest you could make one of these uh, MEMC pages. So we uh, mirrored the whole idea of uh, zero page, the stack and the, the memory below Oz High Watermark stroke page on the uh, BBC Micro by nabbing the first 32K. Um, it says 32 meg there, it should say 32K, sorry, it's a typo. Um, and thus page in basic when you fired it up began at uh, hex 8000, 32K in the memory map. And below that was operating system workspace. <coughs> Graphics memory was up the top of the uh, logical memory, came down from the 32 meg boundary, just like it did on the Beeb, only from 32K. And um, it came down a different distance depending on the screen mode, just like the Beeb. But there was another subtle reason to this, and it somehow it enabled us to do hardware scrolling of the screen because it was against the physical logical memory boundary. And so by cunning use of memory mapping and MEMC, we could make the thing hardware scroll at a terrific speed. <coughs> Rather than, excuse me, my voice is going rather than having to do mem copies the whole time and uh, you'll see that if you ever do a uh, sort of use the thing in um, the uh, ordinary uh, command prompt mode not relevant when you're running the di uh, the uh, desktop came later but the uh, relocatable modules all mirror the functionality of the, the beeb and the else services <coughs> threads through them in the same sort of way and then this guy came along and joined the team. Probably the smartest programmer I've ever met, Neil Rain, sadly no longer with us. He uh, died in a hang glider accident some years later. <coughs> but uh, his job was set by uh, Sophie on the task of doing proper fonts, because we only had Beeb-like uh, character cell-based fonts, which uh, Tim had done in a complete mirroring of the BBC operating system but they wanted to try and do outline and bitmap fonts and fancy fonts of different sizes and so Neil did that to, as his first job and did a thoroughly good job of it too and then uh, decided that he could write a window manager for the system as well and uh, so he did what a smart man and of those addition of those two modules completely transformed Arthur from <coughs> a black screen with a command prompt <coughs> to the desktop that we see now. The famous multicolor Arthur desktop. I'm afraid the color palette was my fault. I was trying to show that it was colorful and at the time the Amiga was very blue with its desktop so I had this very loud electric blue background um, not quite what, sure what possessed me to go with the salmon pink for the uh, window furniture, but there you go. Um, but this is a, the Arthur desktop written in basic by Richard Manby, who'd done all the graphics routines. <coughs> and a word of caution, all you developers uh, who are writing professional software, all demoware will be delivered as product by marketing. We wrote this as a demonstration program and they put it in the ROM for, for the machine uh, and insisted that it shipped with it and that the machine booted up into it, even for those that only had a floppy drive that was probably empty. So the only place to put it was in the ROM. Uh, not, the, not the only time that a demo has finally made it into, into product and uh, it's always very dangerous. Anyway, I talked about uh, ARX and that, that that was developing and that Arthur was really only supposed to be this uh, stopgap. So as we went on and developed Arthur and then developed the, the uh, fonts and desktop for it as well, <coughs> ARX was no further making it out into the, uh, the wide world. 
and a board meeting over at Fullbourne Road was held. And we got wind of it the night before that uh, the ARX guys were going to show up with their uh, A500 with a hard disk, 20 megabyte hard disk and 4 meg of RAM and run a desktop GUI demonstration of their window manager on ARX and that their demo was going to be a ticking clock face program running in a window um, and that what they were going to say was well of course we can run multiple versions of this program um, and that's something you'll never be able to do on Arthur because it can't multitask. Well because they let the cat out of the bag Tim Dobson wrote a clock uh, program in basic for our demonstration running in the uh, uh, Arthur desktop <coughs> world and so we rocked up as well for our slot and we were on second so the ARX guys went on and said uh, look you can open this and click a uh, clock and you can get another one and another one and a fourth one when they got the fourth one running the system ran out of memory and started doing demand page virtual memory onto the hard disk and swapping like crazy because it had used all four megabytes of the uh, RAM in order to get the operating system and the fourth clock application running. And so the hands on the clock face, rather than ticking once a second, started ticking once every 16 seconds. Anyway, they went, it was our turn. We had an early Archimedes production unit with only 256 meg of RAM and a floppy. And uh, we booted ours up and ran as many uh, clocks as you like. I think we got 16 of them going, all running smoothly. And when I say running smoothly, we were animating the hand going round. It wasn't ticking from one second to another, um, which rather uh, showed just the uh, difference in um, character between what you were going to get from these two systems to the powers that be. There was another crackpot idea that I'd had, which went back to using MEMC, and that was uh, to swap out the current language and all its workspace and bring another program in, um, so without losing your workspace. This was the equivalent of the crackpot idea that we had for the B plus 128 and master with their sideways RAM. What we had thought of was assigning one 16K bank of RAM to each language ROM and making it so that you could flip from one to another whilst retaining your work in memory. Um, now we could have done that with a bit of mem copying, but we didn't really quite know which mem memory to copy and there was more than 16K of it and it all got awkward. Or we could do it by actually having the system store the uh, workspace in the uh, sideways RAM as we did with BAS 64. Um, and the idea being you could flip from basic to view to view sheet and back again and not have to keep reloading. So sort of hard context switching if you like. Turned out to be too difficult in the end and we were in the process of investigating it when they knocked on my door and said, you lot come here and write Arthur. So we never got anywhere with it, but we had the idea. This turned out to be just the uh, ticket for unlocking the cooperative multitasking of RISCOS. And I'm running late, so I'll keep going a bit quicker. And it was fundamentally Neil with his uh, knowledge of how he'd written the window manager that put all the pieces together. He said, if we fool around with MEMC, we can do program overlays. We can swap in one program and swap out another, like we'd been talking about. But his idea was to do this on return from WIMP poll. So when you called into the operating system with WIMP poll, it would return to a different program. And lo and behold, that is the way that RISCOS works and uh, allows you to have multiple applications. And it's an idea stolen from good old BCPL and its co-routines as well, really. So all of these things coming together. So this was the, the, the confluence of modules, sideways RAM, all those ideas from the BBC Micro suddenly coalescing to produce this one idea of giving us the, 
the uh, window manager being responsible for delivering the desktop rather than the desktop being an application in its own right and turning everything inside out uh, via this mechanism. Absolute genius, uh, Neil. And so, of course, that's how it still runs today. And I'm very pleased that uh, it, we still see operating systems that look like this. My claim to fame, I suppose, is I invented the icon bar, which sits at the bottom. And I remember when I did it and which room I was in, and we were discussing what the uh, Arthur desktop should look like. And uh, I said, well, look, the Mac at the time, the Apple Macintosh has got uh, a menu across the top with textual items with drop down menus from it. So we'd better put our menu across the bottom instead. And we'd better make it graphic icons instead of uh, having text uh, so that we didn't get sued by Apple because that would have been a very bad thing. And uh, well, there's a quote there from uh, this uh, magazine talking about the fact that uh, Windows 7 had a decidedly dock-like uh, thing and says uh, that the genesis of it all was that it stole it from Acorn's Arthur of 1987. And so, yeah, I think so. I think the Arthur desktop evolved to the RISCOS desktops across the top there. And we know that various people from Acorn departed these shores and went over to uh, California and Seattle and seeded some of those ideas into Apple and Microsoft. And uh, that's where it all came from. So really, that takes us up to about 1988. Uh, something like that. And I left Acorn. I was enticed away by large amounts of money from that man, Clive Sinclair, to come and produce this machine, the Cambridge Computer Z88. So Z80, as the name suggests, most of Clive's best machines were. Um, but it had an operating system that uh, had page ROM uh, in order to fit everything in, called OZ, spelled O-Z and ran BBC Basic, courtesy of Richard Russell, and Colton's Pipe Dream, rather than View and View Sheet. He'd merged them together, or merged the ideas together into Pipe Dream. And sometimes we called it Dozy, rather than Oz, because it had to sleep a lot, because this was a battery-operated machine. It ran on four AA batteries for a whole month. So frugal was it, and so efficiently was the Dozy operating system able to keep going to sleep and uh, not lose your data. Um, exactly the same size as an iPad, it's just rather smaller screen and a black rubber keyboard. And uh, there's a list of the usual suspects down at the bottom there, you can see. But that didn't last very long because uh, Clive decided that the future was satellite dishes. And you don't need a lot of software for satellite dishes, so I went and started my own business. And I wrote the Archimedes Basic Compiler. I love doing this. I love BBC Basic. This was written in BBC Basic and read in other BBC Basic programs in tokenized form and compiled them to produce pure ARM code. And it used the inline assembler to do its code generation, just like I'd done with S. Pascal those years before on the Beeb. And it compiled almost the full spec of BBC Basic 5 including compiling the inline assembler code that you'd used, uh, which confuses some people. So it compiled the code that produced machine code, um, uh, just as if it was compiling any other language. And it even compiled itself. So you, once I'd got it going far enough, I could feed the compiler into itself, running under the interpreter, chewing on its own source code and producing machine code. And I only had to do that twice. The first time I did it, I got something out the other end that didn't work. The second time I did it, I got something that actually worked, which was quite amazing. I mean, I'd done a lot of testing first. It took 28 hours to run the compiler under the interpreter and compile the compiler to produce an object version of the compiler. Not something you really wanted to do every day. But once I'd done it once, 
I then had an object code version of the compiler and I fed the source code of the compiler to that and it compiled itself again. And alleluia, it produced exactly the same object code as itself. And it only took half an hour to do it. So it did it something over 50 times quicker than running it under the interpreter. Um, some, some BBC basic programs really did speed up, especially if they were doing almost no IO. And of course, a compiler is a good example of something that just sits there and chews away. So it uh, really benefited from compilation. And for you BBC uh, Micro fans, I just mentioned this because I also wrote a version that could run on the Archimedes and compile BBC Basic 5 to 6502 machine code for the BBC Micro. And you could either run that in the normal way in the normal uh, memory or split it across the four sideways RAM banks as we'd done with uh, BAS64. Um, so it uh, produced actually the fastest and best and most complete implementation of BBC Basic for the BBC Micro as a result of this. But you had to have a, um, an Archimedes to do the compilation on sat next to it. But it was a great way of, uh, of writing machine code for the, uh, for the Beeb. And as you said, I did it for other processors as well because I could. Then I moved on and wrote Genesis. I wrote it in BBC Basic and compiled it with the compiler. And this created mini websites, pages with frames containing graphics, sound, movies, all the things that RISCOS was good at. It had a script language. In fact, it used the script language to define the pages. So when you wrote when you used the editor and did drag and drop to create your pages with frames that wrote script language behind behind your back and then interpreted the script language to get it to do what you wanted um, and you could also publish and deploy it using a uh, runtime only version of the editor called the browser um, and this was all in 1990 somewhat before the world wide web came into existence and as you can see, it went into the learning curve pack and was bundled by Acorn and uh, they shifted some quarter of a million copies of it or something like that. So um, as they were paying me to, do, to uh, produce it and do it, that uh, was very nice. Thank you very much. Quite pleased with that. Skip forward a few years, though, and I'm coming to the end of the talk. You'll be pleased to know. Um, this is not the end of the story of BBC operating systems from me because in uh, 1997 I got together with some other reprobates ex Acorn, Martin Gilbert who'd designed the Master 128, Jonathan Griffiths, Rocket Raid and uh, Snapper fame, Andy Bray who had uh, written the uh, advanced user guide for the BBC Micro and a few others and we formed a company called Amino. Uh, it was originally Amino Communications Limited, now Amino Technologies PLC, and did various things, but in particular produced the little silver digital set-top box that you can see, which took e Ethernet in, streaming uh, MPEG videos over Ethernet into it, and pictures and sound came out onto the television set. And uh, the incredible thing about this was it had uh, some RAM. Uh, I think we had 32 megabytes in the first ones, and then later ones had more. Um, and it had 128K of boot ROM in it. And the boot ROM contained an operating system called Intactos, which I wrote. And that would uh, boot up and then go star exec pling boot out of the flash file system in the flash memory. And Pling Boot would say run Linux with some parameters and the Linux would come up, take over the machine and do its thing and run applications and then run all of the internet streaming TV services for it. And uh, so this Intactos thing, I would say we shifted 10 million copies of this uh, set-top box design and its uh, variants all over the world, 230 different uh, telecoms customers bought it to stream 
internet TV, um, and this is 15 years before Netflix. Um, and we, uh, well, the long and the short of this is that we floated the company in 2004 for $100 million, which wasn't too bad for four blokes from who started off in a pig shed, which is where we were when we began it. But um, Intactos is the grandson of the BBC operating system, son of Riscos. It has a core operating system and it has smart modules, SM, not RM, everything. And the service calls come from the core operating system, pass round through those very same headers. Uh, so there are star commands, there's even Osbyte calls that go round. And again, writing this, we had Bray Dickens and Holmes's uh, advanced user guide for the BBC Micro on the shelf all the way through as the reference for whatever we wanted. We wrote it in assembler for the 68HCO8, that should say, the Zap2, and then in C for the PowerPC, which powered those little silver set-top boxes, and uh, later versions for STs, processors, ARMs, all sorts of things existed. And just to show you, it's an output from the debug port. You plug the debug port into one of these boxes when it's booting up, and you can see it says Amino Communications Intact OS-32. So this would have been running on a 32-bit CPU at 250 megahertz. And um, then you can see the 32-bit uh, addresses popping out. 14 and four zeros, 148 and four zeros for the next one. And the three-letter name of the module and the version number. And so you can see there were 32K boundaries on which these uh, relocated smart modules sat exactly like the BBC and exactly like RISCOS. Anyway, so I left uh, Amino three years later, having sold all my shares. And we, yeah, there were some other crazy people, Neil Rain, um, and uh, briefly, and uh, uh, Adrian Critchlow from Acorn and others, Jonathan Griffiths again, myself, and we created alertme.com, which produced the array of gadgets that you see in the pictures here. There was a hub and a bunch of sensors that could detect motion and uh, you had key fobs and other gadgets. There's a smart plug. There's a thing that clips around your electric meter feed to measure energy and uh, all of that. And the hub needed an operating system. It had an ARM processor in it. So we wrote Hubos, Jonathan and I, and uh, concocted a, another of our colleagues, Andy Dean from um, Amino into this as well. And it's written in C and it has uh, a core operating system and smart modules and a file system. And the file system, well, you guessed it, it goes star exec pling boot out of the main flash memory filing system and runs Linux just like the uh, set-top boxes did. But not only that, all those little Zigbee radio-based devices, they had an ARM processor with, I think it was 8K of RAM and 32 to 128K of ROM. So in Assembler, we wrote DevOS. And uh, this has smart modules and all of those same features. And it's sleepy. So it pinched the sleepy feature from... Uh, good old Dozy, the Z, uh, Cambridge Computer Z88, and combined all of this lot into these operating systems. And uh, the uh, AlertMe system was sold by AlertMe. It was sold as Iris by places like Walmart in the States. And the whole lot was bought by British Gas. And so uh, if you've got Hive controlling your heating, well, it's being controlled by the great grandson of the BBC operating system because the early versions of Hive's hubs and devices all run HubOS and DevOS uh, in them to some extent. And uh, so uh, if you have a, uh, one of the Hive on-wall heating controllers, it's got DevOS in it, written by Jonathan Griffiths. Um, no doubt, uh, uh, well, I think that's quite amazing. And in fact, British Gas shipped uh, their in-home displays and all of these other units by the million. So there are actually probably more uh, DevOps devices out there um, 
than there are amino set-top boxes with intactos in them and each of those is probably more than all the machines sold by Acorn. So it's spread really quite a long way. And then of course the finally we've got the Raspberry Pi and uh, for the last 10 years or so I was CEO and then non-exec chairman of Kinesium Limited with some of the usual suspects from the Acorn world and a little quote from myself here if I'm allowed to quote myself Kinesium is proud to have worked with Raspberry Pi on video and audio codecs deep in the video subsystem for over five years extending and improving its capabilities we're still in there we're still batting we're still working for uh, Eben and his uh, colleagues at Raspberry Pi doing some of the really deep uh, uh, optimizations and uh, having a lot of fun with that and uh, I still own a slice of Kinesium it's still going so uh, there you go but 40 years on I'm a bit of an old man and I've retired from the full full-time work meet these days so just finally I spend my time doing astronomy stargazing I'm chairman of the local astronomy club in Cambridge and I lecture on astronomy in and around Cambridge anywhere or who will listen and including going on as guest speaker on boards uh, the Queen Mary 2 and her sister ships and other cruise liners when such things are running I'll be back doing it again so uh, that's that's me done so I will quit at that point I think I've been talking for about an hour and a half and my voice is cracking up good and proper now so chair uh, and hand back are we back in the room Think we are absolutely fascinating and thanks very much don't don't be worried about the silence after you talk it always happens because people are usually gobsmacked i know what you lot are like you're shy <laughs> i'll say hello paul it's a long time no see you again who's, uh, who's saying that this, word this sorry brian here from oh hello Andrew brian London. <laughs> hi there yeah so you kind of added more onto your talk from when you did it before and Kind of more history. I think remember we got disturbed last time by the need to move out, move out the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I, I I remember coming down and doing that, and uh, you you had the uh, the riskos only version of that talk, although it started with the a little bit of ROMs and graphics extension ROM, didn't you, Brian? Yes, <laughs> but um, this, given that there was a lot more interest on the BBC side, I thought I'd fill in a lot more of the gaps, and I hope that you can see how there was this this sort of flow of destiny of all of these different bits of what we were doing that all just led one thing to another yeah gxr was good so we got trusted so we got appointed to do the operating system when they were desperate we hadn't done gxr if i hadn't read that one liner in the user guide that said reserved for the graphics extension rom the world would have been very very different so so i i have a, a question paul um you, you seem to have developed um a, a lot of uh, uh products in basic uh in in situations when i think many other people would have immediately gone for assembler or, or at least a lower level language like c um was that in particular because of the strength of bbc basic as a dialect of basic or or, or would you have been doing that kind of um development in basic if you were just um stuck with something like microsoft basic not wishing to slur microsoft but that was a fairly limited implementation compared to what you could do in bbc basic a uh, very good question you're you're absolutely right in that uh, bbc basic was richer in its uh, capabilities um, than good old basic or microsoft basic and people who didn't understand just how flexible it was um, really didn't get it and were tiring it with the same brush as all the other versions um, so yes i think I, it was because of procedures functions the inline assembler all the things i could do with it that uh, and the string handling and all of that stuff was just super for what I was trying to do 
given that a lot of it was uh, syntax parsing and things. So uh, it was the natural choice for me. And to some extent, the alternative was to write in assembler. And um, my whole sort of interest was in compilers. And so if I didn't believe in compilers, what the hell, you know, what was I doing trying to sell them to people? Um, the problem really was that uh, it was quite difficult to produce a compiler for the BBC Micro um, without ending up with uh, running out of memory quite quickly because the compiler itself is quite a big tool. I think the S Pascal compiler was about 20k. Um, the, uh, so you didn't have much room left for anything else. Um, and uh, the the problem is that they're also the 6502 code could be a little bit verbose when the compiler had produced it. It would be bigger than if you'd written it in you, yourself in assembler. Um, so it wasn't the ideal target. And that's why I think a lot of the language is compiled to P code or whatever it was called, Sint code in case of BCPL, um, just for compactness reasons. But it didn't really help them because it, compromised their speed they weren't as fast as uh, the com compiled code could be nowhere near as fast as assembler could be and not much faster than basic um, as interpreted and of course uh, when we went from basic 4 to basic 5 basic got a lot more rich and functional and I absolutely loved it and uh, Oh, the number of times I've sat down and thought about writing basic six, you wouldn't believe. Okay. I'd love uh, to do that. <laughs> you mentioned um, the ABC compiler. It was funny, just it was only a couple of days ago, someone on the Riscos Open Forum was asking about the sources to the ABC compiler because they want to update it. Do you know who actually owns that anymore then? Um, well, Yes, uh, I think so. Uh, I owned it originally, but I did a deal with, what's his name? Alan Glover oh, yeah. and Castle Technology and passed it over to them. And Alan, I think, made it work with Strongarm and fixed all of the sort of supervisor mode stuff uh, there for it and I don't have a copy of the source code that came out of that exercise I do have the source code that uh, came before that okay. um, so I guess it now belongs to Riscos Developments then so if, out Castle, so yeah, if Castle sold everything to Riscos Limited when they died. I don't know whether that argument ever got resolved, but um, whatever happened there, they pr probably could claim they owned it. Okay. Curious. <laughs> what were you thinking of fixing? Well, it wasn't, no, it wasn't me. It was someone, someone else has been oh. asking for the sources who obviously want, I guess, presumably wants to update it to output ARM v7 code or something. Yeah, like. probably. I guess it probably out output stuff that's not legal anymore. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, wonderful uh, <clears throat> presentation. Uh, just a quick one. You were talking about um, writing, uh, sorry, reading from the last four bytes of a ROM to select them. I was wondering, wouldn't it have been possible to have written to the ROM, which would be functionally, um, you know, it wouldn't do anything, um, and, and still be able to read the last four, <laughs> eke those last four bytes of the ROM out, or would it not work like that? Yeah, I thought about doing that, but it turns out that um, the uh, plugging into the ROM socket, you don't have the read-write signal on the pins. So you can't tell the difference. All oh, right. Um, I assumed you did have the read well, right. If I remember rightly, and, and any, and, well, I may be wrong. It's, it was a long time ago, but it resulted in not having to have having to have a flying lead to go and pick up a uh, the right line from somewhere. You're right. 
Right, I thought it might you might have just um, dropped and raised it, whatever line you were um, testing and used the inverse logic, but it, it requires a flying lead, does it? To... You, you could have done it, but you couldn't have told the difference. I think you couldn't tell the difference between a read and a write. Presumably, um, there was some there was some latch or something though that when it when it saw that address and saw a read, that it knew to switch ROMs and. So there must have been a read. I think it didn't right. really care whether it was read or write. Um, it was just any present presentation of that address to the uh, address bus would trigger it. Um, uh, right, that was yeah. one confusion. Uh, so, yeah. And that's what, the, and hence we didn't need to have the flying lead to tell us which it was. Um, and so any presentation of that uh, would be enough. And so on that basis we managed to do this weasel trick of using the uh, 6502's instruction fetch to actually do the triggering um i wish i could find the code it was astonishingly cunning of mr dobson yeah Didn't max like just commented that um roms don't 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 care if you're reading or writing it was just in my head, when I when I heard you say that, I thought there was some Boolean logic saying if it was read and if it was this address. So I thought. Yeah, I think it was any access, and we we had a little uh, latch on our uh, butterfly board that had the uh, four chips on it um, that just looked for the that address on the data bus. If it saw it, then bang, it would write the two bits into the latch, dead simple. Um, we, we did actually make some ROMs, real ROMs, with four chunks of uh, ROM in them and the latch all parceled up into a single chip rather than the, the, the butterfly board. So that was the, the whole objective of it, yeah? Not just to have a board, but just to have a single chip multi-pin chip that you could just plug in as if it was a 16k rom but it would have four lots in there well thanks anyway a fascinating uh, presentation cheers i was going to say very quickly um uh, my brother and i uh worked on um writing a uh, bbc basic compiler or 10, 12 years ago. Um, and the first thing that we ever successfully compiled natively to uh, .NET uh, bytecode, uh, uh, well, it was uh, .NET uh, common language runtime, was uh, Sphinx Adventure. <laughs> Excellent. Um, which uh, uh, my brother was doing majority of the compiler. I was basically reading through the uh, PRMs, re-implementing each of the OS calls. Yeah, uh, but it, that's quite a big job, actually, isn't it? Yeah, um, <laughs> it, it, it's a shame that uh, the website uh, is currently not available because we've actually got um, uh, a full AST and uh, uh, flow graph of every single statement in uh, Sphinx Adventure plotted out as a graph. <laughs> There's no getting away from it. No, no. <laughs> a uh, statement that somebody made once, it said, programming is like sex. One mistake and you end up supporting it for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, we're working on that compiler. Um, it was the year I started uni, um, uh, doing software engineering degree. So uh, I, I learned more about programming in that year on a on a side project than I did in my entire uh, yeah sort of four years at uni. But yeah, I used to, I used to uh, write all my um, university project uh, work in BBC Basic, debug it, run it then convert it into BCPL, wander off down to the computer laboratory and type it in, knowing that it was going to work because it was so much quicker. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, well, I think everyone here will agree that uh, uh, the Acorn machines have certainly had a, an impact on all of us. Uh, 
uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, thanks for the talk anyway. Very useful. Hi, Paul. Um, just to follow up on um, Phil's question about the um, ROM banking, um, do you actually publish anything that use that method? I mean, like the likes of Computer Concepts and Watford um, did a similar thing, but I'm not aware of anything else apart from those two publishers being released. Yeah, we, we gave it to them so they could use it. Right. Fair enough, that explains that. Yeah. Hello, Paul. I was wondering if I could ask a question about the relationship between Arthur and Brazil, the OS that was on the second processor. Is it one's derived from the other or that you just shared the same calling convention? Uh, no, we started, uh, we were given the uh, source code of Brazil and just started hacking. So Brazil was Arthur 0.01. Yeah, I, I noticed on a, um, a library that was originally supported both Brazil and Arthur that the first module, uh, the first system call that got added to Arthur above and beyond Brazil was Oz module, which rather makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brazil, Brazil kind of turned into the core of a, uh, uh, and the, then the, everything else was in the modules. So, yeah. I had another question, Paul. Um, that set top box you were talking about earlier, what year was that, that that came out about? Uh, the, the little silver ones, uh, the first version of it hit the world in late 2002, I think it was. And yeah, um, we sold them to Hong Kong Telecom, the first lot, I think. We'd worked with Ericsson on some earlier versions that were in much larger boxes. Um, and those, I've, I've still got some here, but uh, they, they ran in Tactos as well. Uh, but those were only ever used in trials. And then we built the little tiny silver one, uh, the Aminet 103, the first version. And um, yeah, it's just like a beeb in a box, really. Yeah, and very, very early, really. Yeah, about just the same time, I think online media were the last embers of uh, that bit of acorn were, were also trying to do it and producing great big VCR sized boxes with risk PCs inside uh, but you, they were $1,500 worth of electronics and one of those little boxes that we produced was uh, $70 um, which is why we cleaned up and actually when um, when online media folded we were just on the sort of rising curve of selling those little silver boxes and I hired almost the whole team um, out of uh, online media to come and join us. So people like um, Richard Warren and a whole bunch of other guys all came over to uh, join us at Amino. And you were saying that it wasn't an ARM processor in that. So what version of ARM would have been out at the time? It was a power PC. Uh, with a built-on-chip built MPEG decoder um, called the IBM Vulcan pro processor. Um, what ARM would have been around at the time? Uh, don't know. <laughs> Can't remember. But it was 2000 and, uh, 2001 we were designing it. 2002 we sold the first versions. Uh, 2003 we sold 200,000 of them and then yeah well, the reason I was asking about the arm at the time was you said that they were, they were producing a or, or trying to produce a, a risk PC based one at the same time yeah yeah the various online media boxes that are sort of risk PC equivalents but I don't, I don't know the details of them because they were very much my competitor at that point. 
yeah, well, Lynn in di deepest, darkest Wales, we didn't get streaming video for many years. So that seems extremely early for, to me, 2002. Uh, we were probably yeah. still on dial up at the time. Yeah, we were. I mean, but there were places like uh, Stockholm, there were regions of Stockholm back then that had 100 megabit fiber to the home. Um, and it was Hong Kong networks, they had 10 megabits to every house. So, you know, a four megabit MPEG stream, no trouble at all. BT were probably on 56K dial up. They were. My friend had a very posh 64K ISDN line. Um, so if I ever wanted to use um, Napster, as it was at the time, uh, I, I was working at a local college and we were on a backbone, so I, I could do sort of um, naughty stuff like that, but uh, not at home, <laughs> not for many years after 2002. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any... That's the first I think most of us have heard about Acorn doing a pallet extender. Do you have any more info on that or any idea why they didn't put it in the master? Uh, it was it, it, me and my boys at um, uh, Acorn Soft that were hacking around with the pallet extender. Um, and we weren't really supposed to be. It was one of those projects we did in the evening after the management had gone home. Um, and uh, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> it, it seems but like the biggest omission. On it, se it seemed like the sort of thing that you could really do with, and we, we did have it working at, at one stage, um, and it was quite fun. But I think it was just we were in the wrong bit of the company to produce a hardware gizmo. Yeah. One thing that strikes me as common about all the talks I've heard from people who work to Acorn Soft is um, not just on the technical side, like I, I and probably a lot of the people here are mostly techies, but it sounds like a lot of you learn kind of business acumen and um, the ability to sort of start companies and, you know, non techie stuff, quite a lot of. Um, uh, entrepreneurial um, offshoots from Acorn seem to have been spawned by, by the techie people. Uh, I, I, I'm always uh, gutted that I missed that boat. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. We had some interesting times. I mean, just around about the, uh, the year before the Arthur project kicked off, uh, Acorn had been bought by Olivetti so we had an influx of Olivetti management and I had a guy put in over the top of me um, to replace David Johnson Davis the managing director of Acorn Soft uh, an Italian guy called Vanny Pappi and um, he taught me a lot about business um, he made us properly write justified proposals for everything that we wanted to do um, and uh, show how much we, you know, it was going to cost to do it and how much it was going to um, hopefully make out the end of it. And that was good because I think Acorn had been wasting a lot of money on mad projects up to that point, um, which has got it into trouble. It was doing so many things. Yes bit sticks and voice 500s and uh, all sorts of stuff that you know we probably sold three i like the bit stick actually <laughs> yeah it was all right wasn't it yeah <laughs> i i've asked a few people do, do you remember a company called Cluid technics at all paul you'll have to say that again Cluid technics they they did sort of um installed acorns in schools and actually it's probably uh, early 80s they did the the atoms and beebs in school but we also made a color palette adapter is what why I was uh, why I was asking um, oh right okay I didn't know that no not many people have heard of them really we also did the trekker robot vehicle don't know if you remember that there was the buggy the valiant turtle and, and our thing and 
a couple of other ones. I think I, I remember those because I was in charge of Logo <laughs> and we had to make uh, Logo drive all of those. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if I just read a question out that um, Jonathan's asked in chat, because Jonathan's not got, not got audio capability. Um, what ROMs have the mega banking in them? Um, I can't remember. I think we did... Um, I think we did ISO Pascal like that. We, we, to begin with, we had it as two separate 16K devices. I think it was one of the prime motivations for doing the, the Mega ROM was to get Pascal into one socket. So I think we might have done Pascal. I think we might have done Logo because that was in two slots. And then I think Computer Concepts and Watford also got in on the act. We, we showed them how to do it and uh, they did some as well. Um, I don't know whether we did a combined... Uh, view and view sheet. We might have done that as well. I've got a quick question about the Pascal again. Sorry for hogging all the questions. Um, you said that the S Pascal used um, 16, gave 16-bit 16 results for the arithmetic and that. Yeah. I was wondering, would it not have been possible to have ripped out the, some of the uh, basic floating point? Because if it was if it was that fast a compiled language, it seems a bit of a shame that it was limited to um, sixteen bit values instead of thirty two, and even reals. Um, I just wondered why why you went with some which what were probably very short, simple. Um, multiplication and division um, routines when 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 the 32-bit uh, versions were available in the basic ROM? Um, I think the problem would be that I was very short of memory um, and uh, had I increased the uh, code that it produced to be 32 bit, then the size of the object code that it created would have probably doubled. Um, if, if most things that it was throwing around were 32 bits suddenly, um, uh, it would have certainly had that influence on, on it. Or I'd have had to turn the thing around and make it so that it, the code that it produced was basically a list of jump subroutine instructions to do everything. Um, so by limiting it to 16-bit maths, it was a reasonable compromise for the 6502 to cope with. Um, as regards the floating point, there was no way I had enough memory to uh, have the floating point routines around. So I could have hacked into them and found them in the basic ROM, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I, I, it occurred to me because because you were talking about um, various co commented versions of basic, apart, apart from the two comments commented version. Um, so there was no, with that version of Pascal, there was no like trig functions or anything like that. It was all just your basic no, four-bit banger. It's your only, so it made no sense. Yeah. It, yeah. It, was, it was a toy um, rather than a, a serious uh, thing because I knew that the ISO Pascal was coming. And so really the, the, there was no point in trying to extend it to be... Um, comprehensive because by the time I'd done it, it it would be too late yeah I just thought it was a shame because it, it it does sound like it was fast I mean you had the Jeremy Rushton did like a they they weren't really compiled basics it, it was more or less calls to um, direct calls to basics with without the uh, basic routines but without the parsing function um, so it, 
given that it was such a fast thing, it, it just seems a shame that um, it didn't have a bit more. Yeah, it, he tried, but, to, he tried like to sell said, me that. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, thank you. I mean, Jeremy Rushton. <laughs> yeah. One of the things was that um, it was in our, in our DNA to not rely on undocumented features of the, the ROM and none of our Acorn soft stuff um, in a, from none of the Acorn soft languages stuff anyway, uh, were, would touch accessing anything other than via the fully documented API calls because we were supposed to set the standard for doing it right. Um, obviously the games poked memory directly because they had to, to go fast enough. Um, the, 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 and they, the, in the land of games writing, all bets were off. You could do what you liked. But what we were doing with that and what the guys doing view and view sheet and all of that, everything worked by the book. Um, the only exception was we uh, had to do the OS plotline call, which was an undocumented operating system entry point for GXR. But we had to do that in order that it would, would then work with the future hardware. So it was a deficiency in the operating system. It should have given us an entry point for that and didn't. That was the only time we did it. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that Pascal jump to <laughs> um, parts of the basic ROM if it could. Uh, I was just talking yeah. purely of ripping them out. But uh, yeah, I knew, I knew uh, Jonathan was going to uh, chime in there about the uh, valid calls to the uh, FX calls and so on. because doing it properly in that yeah yeah oh could, uh, could so could s pascal do uh, basic graphics and plots and so, so on yes right yeah so you could write some very nice uh, fast um, graphics demos and things like that with it because it had the ability to spit out vdu codes hi paul um i wrote several of the uh, watford bank switch roms um, the paint one and the desktop publishing one, whopping editor. Um, and they actually behaved in a slightly different way um, to the way you described. And um, what they did was uh, they kept an 8K static chunk of ROM in the bottom half of the 16K area. And the top half then switched in the uh, uh, remaining ROM in 8K chunks. So it didn't actually have continuous sort of 16K pages. Right. Yeah. Um, another thing, um, I, I actually got invited up to Acorn for a demo of the um, uh, pro, of the A500 prototypes um, with uh, uh, um, Arthur and the Arthur desktop on, on them. And uh, one of the demos they showed was um, some sort of uh, uh, Star Wars clips, video clips, uh, which were all animated uh, at the same time. I don't know, do you remember that one? I remember some video clips. Yeah. Well, um, I actually created those clips originally. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it was quite funny when they were being demoed my own, my own original demo. <laughs> so I made it for the BBC. The, the ones I remember that we had as, where we were effectively doing um, little video clips, they'd be called GIFs, animated GIFs these days. We had um, various GIFs of... Uh, um, the guy from the the, the micro program, yeah, that uh, Ian yeah, McNaught that Davis. That was one of mine. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet that would like to ask Paul? We're down to our last five minutes. Okay, is there anyone who's already asked a question would like to ask another question? Now's your chance. Me, I'm just talking to Jonathan about. Um, the the s pascal doing plotting and so on and using the vdu code so was there an s pascal plot keyword or or was it right line um and then the codes for plot whatever it is 19 or whatever it is uh in addition to the standard right and right learn um that you get with pascal i put in um uh WRCH bracket bracket, which called Osrich. 
so, so that you could do that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and likewise, there was a there was all the normal Pascal input stuff, but also there was an Oz Reacher thing in the in the library as an extension, just so that you could write really cool demos like that. Yeah. Yeah, so, but there was no um, sort of plot or draw keyword in the. Pascal. No, I, I didn't have I didn't have room for any of that. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Room was at a premium. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. I spent a week trying to take one byte out of an 8048 uh, <laughs> processor one one yeah. year. <laughs> well, I guess I will probably call this to an end unless anybody else has got anything. I've just got one thing to show you. I've still got the sign off the door. When Acorn Soft shut down, we uh, had at it with a screwdriver. So I've got the Acorn Soft sign. Brilliant. <laughs> I just thought this was a really interesting talk, and it kind of, uh, I see there's a really nice thread of uh, <clears throat> the OS. Uh, the system's running through many different uh, hardware devices. That's kind of cool. And it still lives today. How about that? Absolutely. <laughs>